In today's video, I'm talking with Lauren Leslie. Lauren is a talented textile designer who comes from a rug design background, and we're talking all about getting our portfolios ready for licensing and for freelance work. And we go over common questions like what type of portfolio do you need to get into pattern design? Should you work in collections? What type of art or art director is looking for? How do you get inspiration for new work? And we both give our top tips for portfolio building. So check out this video, which is a recording of an IG Live that we did together. Well, thanks for joining me today, or thanks for hosting me today, I should say. <laughs> Well, this whole um, IG Live was Elizabeth's idea, and we both are really interested in helping people kind of build their portfolios. So we're going to kind of just ask each other some questions and discuss, you know, what are our best tips for portfolio building? So Yeah, and I'm really interested to hear your, your uh, take on some of these questions because um, you worked in-house as well. How long did you work in-house as a, you were a rug designer, correct? Yes, I was a rug designer for seven years. Um, I did graphic design before that. So I've kind of been like a little bit all over the map when it comes to having a portfolio. Um, in college, I was a fine art major. So I've had like a portfolio that was literally one of those like giant portfolios that had just <laughs> a bunch of drawings and paintings and kind of learned how to photograph my work that way. Um, and then I kind of switched routes and did graphic design. So I had to come up with a whole new portfolio for graphic design. Didn't love graphic design. And so then that, that's when I switched into textile design and again, had to totally revamp my portfolio to be relevant for, you know, to get a job in textile design. So totally. So you've been through it. Um, before we start, my other question that I had for you was, do you, um, so now your portfolio, I know you've exhibited a blueprint. Um, so now your portfolio, you're looking to uh, get art licensing work or freelance work or both. What, what's your main goal for your portfolio? So we can think about the context of what we're answering these questions. Yeah. So my portfolio now is primarily for art licensing. Yeah. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. So for me, my portfolio is art licensing. Um what I show is art licensing, what's on my website, on my Instagram, because it's, it's um, you know, it, I own it so I can license it, but it's showing what my skill set is. And so if freelance, you know, companies that hire freelancers see it, then they can also see that I have that skill set and I'm open to working freelance as well. So, um, so it serves two purposes basically. Yeah. And I do a little bit of freelance work as well, but it's kind of from contacts that already knew me from the rug world. <laughs> so Fair enough. I don't have like a big portfolio to present to them just because they already know me. So. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, all right. Well, then I would ask you, what type of portfolio do you need to get into pattern design? Do you only, we talked about that big one that you lug around. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, there's obviously the website portfolios these days, which do you feel, or, you know, in what cases do you feel one is better than the other? Yeah, I think it depends on what your goal is. So if you're looking to get hired by a company, kind of like I did, I really think that you need both a physical and portfolio yes. and a website portfolio. And a lot of people are a little bit confused by that because everything does seem to be moving digital and like you can show your portfolio on your iPad. So do I really need to spend a bunch of money and like print everything out and like make this big book? And I think that maybe eventually you won't have to do that. But as of right now, I do think that art directors still expect to see a physical portfolio and it just makes you look a little bit lazy or like, I don't know, like you didn't put the effort into it if you don't have a physical book. Um, would you agree with that or would you disagree? Yeah, so if you're going, definitely if you're going in for an in-house uh, interview, I would, I mean, the more you can have, the better, right? Like anything you can have on hand. So as I sort of evolved, I, you know, I had three different um, in-house, uh, worked for three different companies in-house. Um, and, you know, I started with this massive, like I said, like 24 by 36 inch portfolio coming out of college with these huge paintings and stuff like that. And it got smaller and smaller in each, uh, each time I was interviewing. Um, and now I have like an eight by 10, that's basically printouts of my work, but it's just like a flip book and it's, 
you know, so having something physical, you don't have to have these massive uh, printouts necessarily, but you just have something physical in case there's, I mean, think about technological, you know, like what happens if the Wi-Fi isn't working and suddenly you don't have your portfolio on your iPad or whatever. Um, I haven't, there was only one case recently, which uh, like I actually needed a physical portfolio and it was sort of last minute. So I ended up going with the iPad situation. Like I was, it was a company that I was freelancing for, but they happened to be local. And so they asked me to come in and she had already seen my website. And like the night before she kind of was like, Oh, what if you have anything else, you know, bring, I was thinking it was just kind of a like meet and greet, but she was like, if you have anything else for your portfolio, bring it in. And I was like, uh, my printer is not like, I was thinking like, I can't print out all this like new work. Cause my, I haven't updated my like eight by 10 in so long. So I did end up putting it on the iPad and whatever, but, um, but in general, yes, I would recommend printing things out if you can, if you're going for an in-house, but luckily, um, a lot of work is remote and, and the website is, has worked for, for both of us. Right. Yeah, I definitely think if you're freelancing or doing something like that, a website is enough. Like, I don't think you need to, because you're probably not going to be meeting, you know, a right. client in person or um, I don't know. So I definitely think a website can be enough. And it's not bad to have the iPad as like a backup or just to show more work. For example, if, you know, a physical portfolio can be really cumbersome and it's hard to kind of switch things out, you know. So one of my other tips was that, you know, if you have a physical portfolio, that it should be a little bit malleable or flexible because a lot of the options out there are just like, um, you can't take the pages out or add pages or, you know, so if you can find one where you can sort of like take pages out or add pages. Yeah, that's what, that's what I have. I see someone has asked the question, what about a blur book? Has anyone done that? And that's a good I think to your point, like a blur book can look really professional. They're so pretty when they're printed and stuff like that. But if you did want to change things around, if you were interviewing for a company where you really wanted to highlight a certain portion of your work rather than the whole portfolio, you wanted to show like, oh, I'm, I can do kids wear really well. So you're picking out all your kids stuff and you're putting it up front. Next big question that I always hear is, should I work in collections? Do you work in collections or do you do one-off print? I really try to work in collections. I think when I think back to my beginner days, I don't think I was very good at working in collections at all. Like I think I mostly had one off prints. And so it's not impossible. Like I still got hired, right? So it's not impossible to um, get hired, especially in house if you're not working in collections. However, I do think working in collections is kind of a sign of maturity as a designer and kind of shows um, that you can think beyond just one design, you know, you can really think in terms of, um, of a collection or of a, of a range. I guess, yeah. A group, a group of products. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I agree with that. And I mean, not that you can never have any one offs and again, for in-house, I think you're right. Like I definitely didn't have that much of that, but I like to work in collections just because it's, it's kind of easier to make five different designs that are all in the same theme and the same palette than it is to make five fully different designs, you know, that are one off. So it's yeah. a little easier for me and it gives me a lot of flexibility as far as um, having motifs and stuff to move around if something gets licensed and it needs to be for a different like layout format or something like that. Yeah, I definitely think once you get the hang of working in collections, it's it saves you time <laughs> and is a bit easier. I just think um, it's something that you have to kind of take a step back and say, oh, can I reuse this little motif and like, you know, make a coordinate or something that was in your main print. So, Right. And so when you make a collection, what, how many prints or do you ever do standalone illustrations or is it always prints? What do you include in your collection? How many pieces? Um, I don't. I don't typically do standalone illustrations now. Sometimes I do, but I try to at least use the same color palette, even if I am creating an, another illustration so that they kind of, maybe they wouldn't be used together, but they at least like look cohesive on my yeah. Instagram feed or something like that. Um, but I mean, in surface pattern design, yeah, I do, I do try to create collections and create coordinates of like the main print. Sorry, what was your main question again? I think I lost How many pieces do you typically put into a collection? Yeah, yeah I would say I do five or six okay. with patterns. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty much around where I was doing. Um, now I feel like it really depends. If I know that for sure it's gonna be going on fabric, then I definitely need to have more. Um, cause I do have a fabric field. So if I'm like specifically designing it for fabric, then I need to have like 
seven or eight. Um, but if I don't know where, if it's not placed yet, then I might do three even just because I can always add to it. But if someone's totally not interested in the look, like I don't want to spend so much time, you know, if no one's going to be interested in it, if they see three pieces, they should kind of get the idea of what I could do with it. So they can always say, I love this, but we need a couple more prints versus, you know, working hard to make five prints and then none of them having any success basically. Yeah, that's always hard to gauge if, you know, you're like, if no one's going to be interested in this, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but then I don't, I want it to, you to know, have present as well as possible. Yeah, of or course. Make a good impression. Totally. I agree. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's obviously a judgment call. Um, I, I do still sometimes do five pieces, but sometimes I will err on the side of like, uh, I think I only have three for this one. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got nothing. So, um, now this question I don't know if either of us can answer with a total, uh, if we knew this, we, we would be rich designers, but what type of art are art directors looking for is obviously a huge question that people are always wondering. I'm curious to hear what, what you think. Yes. Have you ever, you've never been an art director, right? At, when you were working in house? Was I an art director? I was a senior working. designer. I did interview a lot of people um, throughout yep. my job, even when I was in graphic design, but I worked at a small company. So it was kind of like, we didn't have a real recruiter, so my boss was just yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you do it. <laughs> gotcha. So you have a little learn intro. a lot from um, being on the other side of the interview. Yeah. And I think that, honestly, like, it just needs to be relevant work, and it needs to be somewhat commercial work. And that's, like, probably the top two tips, I would say. And that's part of, like, also having a flexible or a malleable portfolio, because if you're going into – um, an interview with a company that does greeting cards, that's going to be a little bit different than if you're going in to a company for an interview who does textiles, or even if you're just pitching for freelance work or anything like that, what you send them is going to be a little bit different. Um, right. You want them to feel special. You want it to feel kind of tailored for them. Um, you know, I mean, I think companies and art directors tend to be a little bit of not have an ego per se, but they're just like, they expect you to like research the company. Yeah, they, want, yeah. they want to know that like, they're your number one pick. You know, they kind of, it's almost like dating, you know, they want to be like, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> your top yeah. pick. They don't want to be like, or what? yeah, for sure. And I agree with that. Yeah. So they, you know, you want to go into an interview feeling prepared. Um, I actually talked to a company, a rug company that was, I thought was needing a freelancer and this guy I used to work with, who now works at this other company, was like, oh yeah, we'd love to get you to do some freelance work. Can you have a Zoom meeting with our um, our boss? And I was like, sure. Um, thinking, you know, they were just gonna kind of give me the scope of the project or, you know, kind of explain yeah, yeah. the project to me. I get to the Zoom call and it's like a full on interview, like as if they're hiring <laughs> someone to be in house oh, okay, and a yeah. full time employee. And I was like, not prepared for that. And the woman was like, well, what do you know about our company? <laughs> I was like, whoa, like, <laughs> this was not what I was expecting. And, um, yeah, I definitely didn't get. <laughs> so, so, yeah, having the information for sure, yeah. And and that's a good lesson of, like, just in case, if you're ever getting on a call, just in case, you know your, yeah. yeah. Know, and I'm familiar with know. the company. It's a rug company. So, like, I know who they are, but I didn't, like, research the history or how it like, got or anything started. like that, yeah. Um, the other thing I would add to the sort of uh, discussion of what art directors are looking for is um, I feel like showing that you can do something that an in-house designer can't do, whether it's you have ideas, not necessarily your uh, more skilled designer, but that you have ideas that are, you know, on trend or whether you have a different style that is hard to replicate in-house. Um, Things or, you know, just have a have a sense of design that's, that, you know, like your layout sense is really interesting. Something that an in-house designer might not have. So if, if you do more simple patterns, um, you have to remember that. Is that something that a, even a graph, even if they don't have an in-house surface designer, what if they have a graphic designer who usually does some of their like, you know, layouts and stuff like that. And is it, if it's, if it's very simple, is it something that even a graphic designer could maybe, you know, put together if they have a good sense of color, you know, you want to think about having those pieces that show a lot of thought, a lot of detail, 
or have some certain style that's maybe a little bit different than someone yeah. can kind of cobble together, you know? I think that one thing that I've seen that's really set designers apart in that kind of situation is, um, and I don't think this is absolutely necessary, but if you do have good drawing skills, that's something that can really set you apart from someone like a graphic designer, not saying that a graphic designer can't draw totally right. plenty that can, but that's not really required for their job. Um, and so even if that art, even if a graphic designer in the company is like an amazing, you know, has amazing drawing skills, the art director may have never seen that from that graphic designer. And so, you know, bringing you in, if you can, if you do have good drawing skills, that's something that I think- More like illustration, be, yeah. being able to infuse illustration into your surface design, yeah. is that, yeah. So with that being said, to anyone who's like, ah, I can't draw, I, I mean, I worked with a girl that had a best-selling rug collection who self-admittedly could not draw. And so it's not like you have to have that, but that's definitely like, you know, a plus on your portfolio if you can show that. I've also heard art directors or just, you know, CEOs say that they really just want to see your create, like how you think creatively. And so mm -hmm. if you can show that process, like step by step, oh, this was my concept. This was my inspiration that I did. This is uh, what I was thinking. And then this was sort of my rough draft you know, sketch, even if you have a sketch or something like that. And then this was my drawing and then I did a bunch of colorways and then this was my final piece. And so if you can kind of take an art director or a CEO through those steps and show how you think, that's going to be really impressive to them because they're going to be able to kind of apply that to multiple projects or say, oh, well, then if I give her this, then I feel more confident that she that can, can do more than that. one style or whatever. That makes sense. Uh, I, I think that works for an in-house, like an interview. I'm not sure how you would put that together for a, like, if you were pitching yourself via email or something, right? Yeah, more for in-house. Yeah, say. that would be a little bit tricky. But there could be a way to, like, kind of, you know, I mean, I think you should send your, if you're pitching via email, you should send your final pieces. But maybe there is a way of, there's a discussion, like, oh, I just wanted to show, like, if, if you get a reply, Maybe there's a way to sort of say, oh, I just wanted to show you I'm working on this new piece and like some sort of like little mini, I don't know what exactly, like video or just like a, a PDF that kind of shows like the sketches into the thing or something like that. Just like, that's an interesting yeah, idea. Yeah, like, you only really need one example. You don't need to do that for every design, right? So, sure. you know, if you were sending your portfolio website, even if it has a password, you could have like a little like a uh, carousel or something at the top that shows your process, but you don't need to do that for everything. It would just be like a little quick blurb. I like that. That's a good idea. Great idea. So next question is how do you get inspiration for new work? Like building a portfolio is a hard thing, right? Like that's the thing I hear the most from people who are getting into art licensing is I have no idea what to draw. Like what should I put in my portfolio? Put anything. There's so many options. Um, what, do you have any suggestions on that one? Yeah, sure. So I, I think we're both pretty big on doing trend research. Um, and <laughs> for me, at least that always helps me feel like really inspired and motivated and energized to do new work anyway. So I think doing trend research, I look at, of course, Pinterest. Um, I also look at runway trends. I look at magazines. I look at different blogs. Um, and so I think it does depend on kind of what industry you want to work in. You know, do you want to work in kids clothing do you want to work for greeting cards do you want to work in um, like home decor you know it really depends on what your industry is on so that you can narrow down like what you're researching but um and how it would be applied but yeah i think you know doing trend research is a good way to start in terms of what you should put in your portfolio and then there's some things that are just kind of everlasting sort of classic motifs yeah. or, or themes and so you know Flowers. something like Florals, Get some flowers yeah. In there. I mean, <laughs> if you don't have flowers in your portfolio, just forget it. Just quit the industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, anything like that, I think, is pretty, you know, foolproof for a portfolio, and it's it's not gonna go out of um, style too quickly. Um, right. But it would also be fun to include like a really up and coming trend. Um, like I remember when the kind of Memphis '80s designs were kind of coming out, and so. Um, you know, that would be something that might have a little bit more of like a shorter shelf life, but, um, you know, to show that you've done the trend research and that could be very exciting for a client or an art director to see. Yeah. Um, for people who are, don't know Lauren, she does 
really awesome trend guides. You do like once a year a really deep dive trend guide, right? I do. <laughs> yeah. She does deep dive, and they're they're gorgeous. Her trend boards, I mean, they're color and pattern. Um, and I do monthly trends in my newsletter, but it's um, it's not so much of a deep dive. It's like one motif. Uh, you know, like bees are trending or butterflies or like what, you know, I, I'm trying to think of what my one was from last year, last month. I can't even think of it. Tie dye, I think. So, you know, it's just like one thing, but Lauren goes, goes deep into it. So she's, she's great with trends as well. Um, so as far as me get for inspiration for new work, I would totally agree. Like trends really have helped me studying the trends have really helped me, um, brainstorm new work. And sometimes I'm kind of resist, not resistant to trends, but I'm like, I don't, you know, people don't want to, especially artists don't necessarily want to like just do everything that's on trend, like so trendy because you feel like you're like following the crowd or something. And artists always want to be like their own person. But um, I find that it really helps get the wheels turning for new, newer ideas, you know, that aren't even in the way of a trend but just like you know just makes me think of other ideas so i find that really helpful right right and i think it's also you know again kind of like the in-house or the licensing like are you trying to present work to an agent or because that might be a little bit more special like you want to stand out from the crowd a little bit more but if you're applying to be in-house um not that you don't want to like show your own unique style but they also want to see that you can you know that you have range yeah, range, but they also want to see that you can do like kind of like boring stuff, like not boring, but you know, like more mass market. Uh, yeah, that's stuff. True, true, true. Yeah. So, I yeah, I think having a range is great. So, let's kind of wrap it up a little bit with our top tips for portfolio building. What do you want to start or? Uh, sure, yeah, I actually wrote sure. them down. So, uh, perfect. Yeah, I know. I have, I have my down. We talked about having um, kind of a malleable portfolio and flexible. So obviously a website is already gonna be flexible. You can add stuff or delete stuff as you need to. Um, but with a physical book, um, like someone asked about the Blur books and like you said, they do look really great and really professional. But even when I exhibited at Blueprint Show, it was kind of like, ah, oh, should I do a Blur book or not? <laughs> and um, I think just the fact that I couldn't take pages out or add pages in for the next time, I kind of felt a little bit like it would be a waste of money or I wouldn't get the longevity out of it. Um, so sense. it really is a personal call, but that's why I didn't do a blur book. Um, and then the next thing would be to show your color palette and kind of like we already discussed, show your creative thinking process. So whether it's a sketch or whatever and your color palette, it could just be like little color chips underneath your design to kind of show what you were thinking in terms of, you know, the colors. And then Another good thing that you can do is add, and again, it doesn't have to be for every design. It could just be like one or two pages, but to add some mock-ups or kind of some photographic uh, scenes where you show that your designs are, how your designs are being used. And this would be a really great one to kind of, um, you know, I guess, butter up the, <laughs> the art director of, you know, if you do it on their product specifically, they're going to, they're going to be impressed by that and say, oh, wow, like this really does look good on a rug or on curtains or on a gift what bag or whatever it is, yeah. you know, I could really see us using this designer um, or these designs. And then my last tip would just be to present commercial work, um, especially for me, I think coming from a fine art background, um, I was doing a lot of like moody, like, I don't know, like introspective type of stuff in college. And so it took a little while for me to kind of put my design hat on and say, okay, this is not for me. This is for the client, you know, and to kind of work that way. So if anyone is coming from a fine art background, I would just say, you know, commercial work is important. It doesn't mean that you can't have your own style or have originality. You definitely can, but just make sure that it is usable. Is it something that you would actually buy? It's just a good way to. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, my tips for portfolio building are give yourself assignments, right? So when I first started, I didn't have, when I first left my in-house job i didn't have a big portfolio of my own work i all my work was stuff that you know was owned by my employers and so i looked at companies that i wanted to work with and just gave myself assignments like i was like okay west elm i love west elm i'd love to have west elm bedding okay 
designed a West Elm bedding collection, you know? And I mean, I put a name to the company and then I studied what they had and came up with something that was my own design. And then I had a collection and it doesn't take, I can obviously show, it's still in my licensing portfolio. It doesn't really look like everything else looks like West Elm and not Elizabeth Silver, but that's okay because I was starting and I was building and that's, you know, that's kind of how you do it. I did the same thing for like Victoria's Secrets. I said, like, I want to do like a set of prints that could be for like robes and bath, you know, lingerie, everything, all of the pieces. And so I did like a, a group based on that. So think of where you want to work and just like just pretend you do work for those companies, like assign yourself those type of, those type of tasks. Um, and then of course, my biggest like for everything, my advice for everything, if you ever come at me, is going to be like, get started, just get started. You know, I mean, it, it seems so simple, but like, I do this too. When I'm thinking about my next collection, I'm like analyzing like, oh, I haven't done a Christmas collection in a while. Maybe I should do that. Like what has been most successful? I'm like doing like analytics on my portfolio or something. No, just start something because you won't get anywhere if you don't just start. And recently I was talking to someone and they were, they gave me, they didn't give it the tip to me, but they were saying how they did it. And I was like, I'm going to use that is she does, she does um, collections, but she starts with her coordinate, like her simple coordinates rather than the hero print or the main print, because she felt like the main print is kind of overwhelming. And like, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to like work it out. So she just starts with something really simple and then gets like more complex as she goes along. Oh, and I'm like, funny. that's I a good way to kind of, of that. yeah, I mean, well, me too, but like, okay. If you're having trouble, do something simple and then add to it, like, you know, just to get over the hump, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. that's my thought. And the other advice that I, that I always or try to live by is done is better than perfect. So, again, like, it's similar to the get started, you know, it's just, like, do it. It might not be perfect. It doesn't have to be perfect. Your portfolio is an evolving thing, right? Um, so, it's managing to just say, I did it, It's I did something, I'm happy with it for now, or I'm not so happy with it, but it's done and I will move on and I can come back to it. It's always evolving. I love that, yeah. It's almost like your portfolio is this living thing that you have to like totally. water and take care of and you see it grow. <laughs> and um, I think that kind of goes back to the, it being malleable point. So if you, you know, if you do a new collection and then you're like, eh, I don't really like this old collection so much anymore, you just replace it. It doesn't mean that it's a permanent thing, which is why a blurb book is a little bit hard because it does feel like this permanent thing that you now have to show forever. But that's not the case. <laughs> you can always do new collections, take stuff out of your portfolio, add stuff to your portfolio, add stuff that's more relevant for a certain client or a certain interview. Um, totally. I love yeah, that advice. Exactly. I love the done is better than perfect. So just put something in there, just get started, and it's not permanent. You can continue to change it. That's so true. And I know that you have something coming up that people can, if, if they need help getting started, you have something really exciting that you're launching. Well, you've been launching, but it's starting in a couple days, right? Yes. So um, on June 1st, uh, my course Portfolio Surge starts, and it really just provides a framework for everything that we've been talking about. So as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth was saying, just get started. But it's hard when you don't know what exactly to design or, you know, what the trends are and you feel like maybe you don't have time. Maybe you're also working a full-time job and trying to get this done on top of that. Maybe you have kids, um, something like that. And so a lot of the work is already done for you with Portfolio Surge. You get a trend board, a color palette, and a video lesson every other week. And, um, and it goes all summer. So it's 14 weeks long. And then there are also some bonus lessons at the very end of the course. So it just really helps provide that framework for getting started. It gives you something to create, something to do. And the reason why it's uh, two weeks for each lesson is because I really want everyone to be able to feel like they have enough time to design little yeah. mini collections. Cause I do feel like that makes your portfolio stronger. Um, like we said, we both got hired without collections, but you're going to have a leg up if you have your work in collections. You just look like a more mature, sophisticated designer. So that's why I framed it that way. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. We've already had about 30 plus people sign up. So, awesome. Yeah, it's really good. So if you're interested and you're uh, part, it's, it starts June 1st. So you can, it's, people can still join until People can Sunday. still join. The cart closes on May 30th. So I think that's tomorrow. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, the link is in my bio, um, go sign up and 
yeah, I'd love to have you in the course. And you also have um, another course coming out sort of related to portfolio building as well, right? Well, it's a course that I've had, uh, I I released a while ago, but yeah, it's, I I have a course called Successful Licensing Collections, so very specifically about collections and sort of how to make a cohesive collection. I'm not really teaching any artwork, but I'm teaching themes that are um, great for licensing and how to analyze your own work, like critique your own work. Isn't that the hardest thing about being, working from home or like, you know, working for yourself, just like. You do this stuff and you're like, I don't, it's not right, but I don't know how to fix it. And like, you wish you had that art director to send it to so that they can make the comments and you don't have to worry about it. So I try to address that in my, in my course with uh, sort of some question, a questionnaire for you to self critique your work and uh, make the best piece you can and the strongest collection that you can. So, um, ElizabethSilver.com slash learn, you'll see successful collections. But mostly, I'm just um, so happy to get a chance to catch up with you and sign up. For, you have a newsletter, right? A lot of the newsletters are just um, trying to, you know, kind of teach artists how to be a textile designer. A lot of it is related to my YouTube content. So I also have a yeah, YouTube you have a channel. Great YouTube. So it's yeah. just kind of talking about some of the same things I talk about in my YouTube videos um, yeah. and kind of notifies you if there is a new video. Um, it notifies you if I have a course coming out or anything like that. I also have a, a membership that's totally free. Um, it's in the Design Tribe Facebook group. So if you're interested in that, you'll get um, access to Facebook Lives kind of before anyone else. I will like the next week upload that video to YouTube and usually edit it, but you'll get to see it first if you're in the Facebook group. Um, yeah, so I, I notify awesome. people in the email list about that. And then once a year, yeah, I do, <laughs> I go really deep into the trend research. Um, and then that usually kind of lasts me all year because I'm crazy and I just, I can't like stop once I do start doing it. Yeah, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah, your YouTube channel, I forgot to mention that, but you have a great YouTube channel. So people should check that out. And my, trend, my newsletter is, I do trends once a month and I do like, creative freelance advice once a month. So you can head to my website or my link in bio or whatever and find that. So, well, thank you, Lauren. It was so good to see you. I know, so good to see you too. Have a wonderful weekend. Okay, you too. Bye. Thank you everyone for joining. If you found this video helpful, please share it with some friends, subscribe. And if you like the IG Live interview format, you know, we I've been getting more into doing IG Lives lately, and sometimes I have time for questions and answers. So be sure to follow me on Instagram at eSilverDesign so that you can get notifications for when I am doing my IG Lives and hopefully, you know, contribute, ask some questions, and get a little bit more in depth.